open up our Bibles, please, to John chapter 15 this morning. John 15. And we'll go ahead and ask the Lord for help with our Sunday school lesson here this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning, Lord, and thank you for this chance for us to come together here at Bible Baptist Church to learn more about you and your word. And Father, I just ask that you uh, fill us with the Holy Ghost, so we'll be able to illuminate us and teach us with regards to what the Lord uh, preached to the eleven here in John 15 during the Upper Room Discourse. And we give you thanks and praise, Father, for all things, but especially for that salvation that you wrought through your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> this morning we'll continue our studies here in the Gospel of John, and we're in John chapter 15, John 15 here. And we ended John 14, seeing the Lord tell you the eleven, Arise, let us go hence. And there I went ahead and posited the idea that they actually got up from where they were reading and they started walking towards the garden over, over in Cedron, as said in John 18. So John 15 is interesting. It starts talking about some stuff we're going to actually... They would have actually seen these things as they walked down this road. So it's kind of like going through life and now all of a sudden the preacher starts giving you wisdom about cars and about society he's walking through the city it's that kind of thing okay that's, that's kind of how you know how somebody's godly it's just everything connects to jesus christ somehow so the lord is giving us this example here and he says in john 15 verse 1 so you can see what he was actually speaking about we'll go ahead and read all the way to verse 11 the bible says i am the true vine and my father is the husband, and they were walking past vineyards as they were going to this garden over in Cedron. Okay. Verse 2, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you, continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. And here we basically led, or we basically read, the key to the victorious Christian life right here in these 11 verses. Okay? It's profoundly simple what the Lord says here, and it's also simply profound to see it in action. Okay? And I think the saddest part about this is as simple as this is, this isn't really practiced by 90% of Christianity these days. Okay? It's a sad reality of what's happened to uh, Christianity during these trying times. And the reason for this is that they don't actually follow these verses here as given in the Bible. Okay? It's almost as if they don't recognize that they need to be in the true vine, which is really the key of the whole thing. Okay? So we'll go ahead and look at these verses and see how the Lord tries to express how we can have a victorious Christian life by abiding in Him. And He starts off in verse uh, 1 giving His seventh I Am, where He says, I am the true vine. And the question is, well, what is he referring to? Because remember, he's talking to the eleven, and they're Jews, and they know their Bible okay, much better than us Gentiles who got saved. So let's go to Psalm 80 and take a look. Psalm 80, we'll go to some verses that aren't always used for this. Okay. Psalm 80 in verse 1, Bible says, This is a psalm of Asaph, okay? and he says, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock. Thou that dwellest between the cherubim shine forth. And here we have the psalmist talking to the shepherd of Israel, which is the God of Israel. And he refers to Joseph, so the context is talking about the nation of Israel, those peoples. Verse 8, same psalm. 
Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. And as we know historically in Exodus, the Lord redeemed Israel out of Egypt and brought them out. And he's calling Israel his vine. Okay. But what's interesting is that the Lord says that he is the true vine, even though Israel, that nation, is called a vine. And the question is, what's going on there? Okay. Well, the Lord is trying to bring a reality here. Okay. He's trying to show the eleven the difference between Israel, after the flesh, okay, and spiritual Israel, the ones that are the Israel of God. And these eleven here, they're part of that true vine, which is found in the Messiah, who is a physical Jew, okay, but also obviously the God of Israel. He's the shepherd of Israel himself, manifest in the flesh. Okay. And I think that's important to understand because we got a lot of people who are part of Israel today who are trusting a little bit more in their physical genes and their DNA than they are trusting in the Messiah. And they can actually be true Jews ethnically. Okay? Like their DNA actually has Judaic lineage. They're part of Israel. Or they can be the rest that try to pretend they're Israel physically. Okay? Either way, the question is whether or not you know the Messiah. Okay? Now you might say, well, why is this so? Why does the Lord have to take the time to say that he is the true vine? What happened to Israel to where they couldn't just be the vine and stay that way? Well, unfortunately, there was a progression that happened over time after they were redeemed out of Egypt. A lot of ups and downs they had with the Lord historically. Okay. Go to Hosea 10. Let's see the conclusion of this. Hosea is one of the minor prophets with a major message in there. Hosea 10, verse 1. This is God talking, and now he says, Israel is an empty vine. And there's the problem. Okay? They're not bearing fruit. They don't seem to abide in the shepherd of Israel. Okay? Why is this? The Lord explains. Verse 1, Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. Okay. So it's not that there isn't fruit brought forth. It's the problem is the fruit is brought forth unto themselves. It's not fruit that's brought by God. Okay. Verse 1, according to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased the altars. According to the goodness of his land, and this is the Lord being sarcastic. Okay. God is sarcastic, by the way. It's not their land. It's not their, it's, none of it's theirs. Okay. He, it's God's. God gave it to them to use. Okay? To Manuel's land. But they're empty, and this is how they think. So you figures, let me tell you. According to the goodness of his land, they have made goodly images. Okay. Verse 2. Their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. He shall break down their altars. He shall spoil their images. For now they shall say, We have no king, because we fear not the Lord. What then should a king do to us? Good question. And there the king of Israel manifests in the flesh is talking to the eleven, saying, I am the true vine. But most of Israel is saying they don't have a king. Okay? They're not fearing the Lord, and so they couldn't see the Messiah. That's a sad thing. Okay? Like I said, you'd have to go through the history to see the ups and downs. And even during the time of Jesus Christ, we see that only some believed on the Messiah and the rest did not. And that continues on today. Verse 13, same chapter. Verse 13. What's the result of being an empty vine that bears fruit unto themselves? Ye have plowed wickedness. Ye have reaped iniquity. That's what happens. Because if you're not plowing and you're not reaping in accordance with the God of Israel, who is truth, what else do you have left? That's why Jesus is the true vine, you see. He's not the error, the, the vine full of lies. That's not the case here. Okay. Ye have eaten the fruit of lies. There's the fruit they brought forth. Okay? Because thou didst trust in thy way, not the way, Jesus Christ. In the multitude of thy mighty men, which might have been the Pharisees and Sadducees, at least at that time, the Sanhedrin. Okay? There's their mighty men. I'm going to trust in them over the God of Israel, over the shepherd of Israel, who is the way, the truth, and love. Okay? Jesus Christ is the true vine. Now, usually Isaiah 5 is used to show this reality about Israel, and there you'll find out that they didn't give good grapes. Instead, they gave wild grapes, giving you an idea of what kind of fruit they were bearing, and it wasn't good. Okay. Go back to Psalm 80. Go back to Psalm 80. And interestingly, the psalmist talked about 
Israel being the vine and all this, but if you kept reading this, this beautiful psalm here, you'd find out that stuff happened to the vineyard, okay? Giving you like a little summary of the history of Israel. And then you go to verse 14, and you'll see something mentioned here, okay? Giving you an idea of what the Lord's referring to. Psalm 80, verse 18. Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts. Okay, because there were some that were trying to find God. Not all of them rebelled. Thank praise be the Lord. Okay? Look down from heaven and behold and visit this vine. So he's asking for God to come visit Israel, who's Jesus Christ. And the vineyard which thy right hand hath planted, who's the right hand of God? And the branch that thou madest strong for thyself. Remember that Jesus Christ said that he is the true vine, but then he said his father is the husbandman of that vine. And the Lord decided to plant his true vine right there in the middle of Israel so people can make a choice to go with his son or against his son. That's a choice we all have to make today as well. Okay. And notice that the father, he's the husbandman in this case. Okay. Because salvation is a work of God, and that includes sanctification as well. God's the one that's got to put the work on you as you choose to simply live for him. He does everything else. Praise the Lord for that. Go back to John 15. John 15, let's continue on, verse 2. So this is why Jesus Christ is the true vine. You need to be in Him so that the Father can work on you and make you better, Christian. John 15, and if we were to look at verses 2 and 3, let's look at verse 2 right after that, away in colon. I'll read everything afterwards. And every branch that beareth fruit, he, that's the Father, purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Now you're probably wondering, how come the Lord just threw the word in there? It seems kind of weird. He's given an illustration, and all of a sudden he gives some doctrine. Okay? She's trying to give you a hint on the reality of the situation. Okay? It's through the word that the Father purges you or makes you clean. So that you can be more holy, that's sanctification. Okay. Go to Matthew 13. Famous uh, parable here, Mystery Parables Discourse. Matthew 13, verse 23. We'll read a verse that tells you your goal. This is what every Christian should strive to be here. Matthew 13, verse 23. But he that receives seed into the good ground, the seed is the word of God, by the way. Good ground is your heart. Is he that heareth the word and understandeth it. There you go. Which also beareth fruit. So now you're in the true vine because you're in the word of God. The husbandman who's the father, he sees that. You're bearing. He decides to purge so you can bring forth, verse 23, and bringeth forth. And then it tells you some in hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. But the key to bearing fruit and bringing forth more fruit in your Christian life is to abide in the true vine. To abide in Jesus Christ so that the Father can sanctify you and make you holier. He does the work. Okay. And he does it through the word. Now, we all understand that the word is compared to water, Ephesians 5 verse 26. But let me ask you something about grapes. Okay? You ever seen a grape? Okay. They tend to be really juicy, don't they? Okay. Scientifically speaking, uh, grapes are 90% water. Not a surprise, right? Full of water. And if you're a good grape and not a wild one that dries up like a raisin, okay, if you're a good grape, you're going to be full of that water of life. You're going to bear fruit to others. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now also, when we read that verse, we notice that the father being the husbandman, he's pruning, he's cutting, he's going to take pieces off that branch. So it can bear more and more fruit. If you know anything about growing grapes and all this, okay, and I don't know much, so I just read about it. Okay, I've never done it. I'll let you know. But it's typical for them to cut back certain portions of that vine yearly, especially the dead parts, so that they can bring forth more fruit later on. Okay? And that's exactly what the Father wants to do with each and every one of us. Because Jesus Christ is the true vine, we're just the branches. And Guess what? There's going to be a good amount of our portion, which is that branch that brings life and is trying to live for God. There's going to be parts that are kind of dead. But the Father sees that you're abiding in His Son. And He says, look, you're, you're bearing fruit. 
Let me cut that dead part off. Let me get rid of that besetting sin in your life. Let me help you have victory over sin. See? And you're going to bring forth more fruit. That's the idea that the Lord's presenting as He's walking with the eleven here. Teaching these doctrines that we've expanded upon over the years. Okay. Now also in verse 2, okay, I think the Lord said, let me go there and just read it. He said, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Now this is a verse that uh, some people read and they think, well, what does that mean? Am I going to lose my salvation? I'm out of the vine. I got taken away. Okay. Now, I don't care what camp you're in. My question is, did you run a cross-reference? So check on this. Okay. Is your idea in line with what Jesus is saying? Let's actually run a reference. Go to Ezekiel 15. What's he talking about? Is he talking about your salvation or is he talking about living for God? Is he talking about you getting justified or is he talking about you working for God? What's the situation here? I know many other, other brethren are thinking, well, the context should be enough. And I agree, but unfortunately for some that's not enough. Okay? The Lord is giving an illustration, so I'll give that person credit. Here's some doctrine, Ezekiel 15, verse 2. I'll read verse 1, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, So the word comes to Ezekiel and says, Son of man, what is the vine tree more than any tree? Or than a branch was among the trees of the forest? Shall wood be taken thereof to do any work? Notice that. Or will men take a pin of it to hang any vessel thereon? Behold, it is cast into the fire for fuel. The fire devoureth both the ends of it, and the midst of it uh, is burned. Is it meat for any work? See? The vine tree, as an illustration, is also connected to the works you do for God, not your salvation. This is plain as day right there. Okay? It doesn't say grace. I, don't, I didn't see that there. See? I think that's very important to understand. Because what the Lord is saying is that if you're not bearing fruit, okay, then He's going to take you away. He's not going to use you to serve Him in this life. Okay? You're going to be a carnal Christian that won't be any testimony for somebody else to get saved. Okay. And talking about today, let, let's be honest, a lot of Christians fall into this bracket. And it's a sad thing. But thanks be to God, if you make the choice, even as one of those dead pieces of branches that have been bearing fruit in a while, if you decide to submit yourself, therefore, to God and start drawing nigh to Him, you will start bearing fruit, and the Lord will use you. The choice is yours, Christian. Okay. Do you want to be a disciple or not? That's what decides on whether or not your works are useful to God. That's what decides whether or not you're going to bear good grapes that are full of water, or you're going to be some of those wild grapes that that empty vine of Israel was bearing at some time. And you might think you're doing a lot of work for God. You might think you've done so and so, you've got all this money, I got great ministries. When you get to the judgment seat of Christ, okay, or some call the bema seat, you're going to find out that all that was just chaff to be burned. You're going to be ashamed. Simply because you didn't decide to serve God the way He told you. Okay. Okay. Basically speaking, God isn't a pragmatist. I'm, the ends don't justify the means for God. He's about people being faithful regardless of the results. Are you going to do things according to my word? Okay. John 15. John 15, go to verse 4, first phrase there says, abide in me. And there's the key to biblical Christianity. There's the key to being a good independent Baptist, good Presbyterian, good whatever denomination is. Are you abiding in Jesus? Because the denominations don't really matter that much. Okay. And I say this because some people read that and they think abide in independent Baptist movement. Abide in Pentecostalism. Abide in the doctrines of, I don't know, any, any of their great preachers they like. Okay? You can think of the guys in the past, Luther, Arminius. Okay? That's what I'm abiding in. No, he said abide in me. Jesus Christ is the true vine. See? Doesn't say abide in your church. You got to abide in Jesus who will lead you to a local church that's good. Okay? 
For those that are into that whole fear of man, holiness, super Pentecostalism, it doesn't say abide in your pastor's name. That's not what it says. It says abide in me. Okay. Why do you choose to live under the snare of a person like that who does not abide in Jesus Christ because he actually thinks he can tell you how to live your life in that way, in that direct way? Okay. Abide in me, Jesus says. And we, we also the verses in John 8. He talked to those who believed on him in verses 31 and 32. And then he said to them, if ye continue in my word, because Jesus Christ is the word of God, ye shall be my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, not set you free. A big difference. Okay. You're made free to where you're actually not under the condemnation or the issues that the devil, the world and the flesh can give you. What a blessing, but you have to continue in his word. Okay. And he continues in verse 4. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No kidding, it's got to get that source, that root and the fatness and the water that comes up from the root. Who's the root of the stem of Jesse? That's Jesus Christ. There it is. Okay. Except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. Know your place, Christian. Okay. A lot of Christians would think that they're the vine. Okay. No, God should rule your heart. You should be crucifying yourself every day, not the other way around and putting him on the cross. Okay. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Why? For without me ye can do nothing. I think this is important because there's a lot of Christians who are not abiding in Jesus Christ when they do good works that look holy and saintly in all this. And this is going to be the result. Their works are going to come up in the judgment seat of Christ and they're going to find out that they were worth nothing eternally from God's perspective because they're going to burn up. They're not going to stay. They're not going to go with them forever. Simply because they couldn't do the simplest thing was to focus on Jesus. They focused on themselves. That tends to be our biggest problem. Okay? We choose not to die to self. Okay? We choose to live for God and ourselves. We choose to find some kind of middle ground on the situation. For example, I don't need the Word of God. Okay? I got enough from all these textbooks and all that. I can just do that. No, no, you can't. You need to abide in the Word of God. That's who Jesus Christ is. Okay? What you think about the Lord and His Word, is a, or what you think about the Word, is a reflection of what you think about Jesus Christ. Let's be honest on that. Now, I thank God you can run into a Christian who at least tries to serve God. You think of uh, Peter when the Lord told him to go ahead and cast the nets on the right side initially. You know, his faith wasn't great. Okay? He threw one net over there, but he still did it. At least he threw something. Okay? The Lord can work with that. You're willing to abide in the Lord's words and at least try and put a little faith out there. And it resulted in those nets breaking. But Peter showing his growth, especially after hearing this chapter firsthand. Okay? The Lord told him to cast nets. He threw nets over there. And them great fishes and them nets did not break, John 21. That's the key. That's what you want to do as you continue to abide in the true vine. It's growing grace and knowledge that you too can be a disciple of Jesus Christ. John 15, verse 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Okay. Now the issue here, okay, talking about this man here, because this man is not in the vine, okay, it's not getting water. See that? It's starting to wither, as it says. Okay. It's dying. Okay. It's drying out. It's dead. It's not useful to God in this life. But notice, notice that the Bible doesn't say, and God gathers them and casts them into the fire. That's not what it says. Interesting, right? It says in men. Even though the father's a husband, it's going to be other men. Men of this world are going to gather those withered branches and cast them into the fire of judgment here. Okay. Now I look at this spiritually as referring to that carnal Christian who goes back to the world, okay, and then they start receiving the consequences of their decision to live for the world instead of God. 
which is basically the fruit of sin, okay, the fruit of lies, okay, them wild grapes, and all of a sudden you got other men in the world criticizing them for their hypocrisy. Because yeah. if you're truly born again and you try to go back to the world, it's going to be very difficult to try to live on both sides. Even people who don't know God can recognize you used to live for them and they're going to get on your case. Okay. What are you doing here? Why are you living like this? Yeah. They're going to criticize you. Oh, look at you. Look at what Jesus did for you. Look at the way you live. Okay. Now this happens. Okay. Paul even testified to this about one individual in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 5 to whom he said to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Okay. He wants to go to the world, let him go. And he'll deal with destruction. That the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And that's the goal here. And I'm glad to know that this individual specifically, okay, figured out living for the world wasn't great, and he decided to go back to get into that true vine. And that's why in 2 Corinthians, you tell Paul, you see Paul telling the Corinthian church to receive him because he repented. It's in 2 Corinthians 1. So that destruction doesn't have to be complete to where the person physically dies. It could lead to them to recognize they need to go back. They need to be like Israel who went away from God and then things happened, consequences. The Philistines came in and destroyed their lands and then they repented and came back to the great shepherd of Israel asking for forgiveness and redemption and rescue and he brought it. Go to 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2. Second Timothy chapter two. I'm gonna read some verses here. Second Timothy two. I'm gonna we'll start with verse nineteen, which is a verse that shows eternal security. I'm gonna show you what God has allowed every born again Christian to do once they received His Son as their Lord and Savior. Second Timothy two verse nineteen. The Bible says. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. That foundation is Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 3. Having the seal. People ask, well, what's the seal in Ephesians 1? This is what it is right here. Okay. This is the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. That's one part of it. And a different part. Okay. So the first one's great. God knows who's his. You may not be able to look at a Christian's life and say that you know what they're saved, but at least God knows. Eternal security right there. So, Lord knows who, who are his. And some might be like Judas Iscariot and look like they live the life and they're not saved. The Lord knows who they are. Okay. But and, and this is the part that we have to recognize, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You now have the capacity by the Spirit of the living God, which is that seal, okay, given there. You now can make the decision to depart from iniquity. You are allowed to. It says they're let. You now have that capacity. You didn't have that before when you were lost. Romans 6. All you could do was bring fruit unto death. Yeah. Okay. This is a great verse, preacher. 2 Thessalonians 2. He who now letteth will let. That's the person right there. Okay, if you ever wanted a cross-reference. See that? Holy Ghost in us. So we can't be here. But that's a whole other topic. Verse 20. Okay. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. Okay, some Christians are going to live for God and receive honor, and some won't. Based on what they decide to do with the seal, do they choose to depart from iniquity? Do they choose to abide in the true vine so the husbandman can work on them and make them more and more holy? That's a decision they have to make. 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, so you're not that trash vine that gets burned, Ezekiel 15, and prepared unto every good work. Now you can do work that's considered good from the standpoint of God Almighty. He can make sure that even if you toss one net instead of all the nets he said, you can still get some fish. Okay. That's the key. Have you submitted to God? Have you gotten the true vine? That's my question. 
Well, I believe in Jesus. Usually it's another Jesus. That's your problem. The Jesus of the Bible is one we're talking about. Clearly, that's what we're reading here. Back to John 15. John 15. You know, I get it. When you grow in grace and knowledge, the Lord even recognizes that you should follow men. He teaches us. Okay, that's why there's elders in the faith to learn from. But their goal is to get you to see Jesus Christ in them and have you manifest more of Jesus Christ in you so you can get to their level and you can both serve as brethren to Jesus Christ directly. That's the goal. Okay. And as he talks to the 11 who are going to be responsible for upturning the entire world in Acts, okay, he's telling them, you need to abide in me because he's right there. John 15, verse 7, starts, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you. Okay. That sounds just like verse 5. We already discussed this. Okay. Need to abide in him, and he in you, which are his words. Have you put the words in you? Have you continued in his word? That's the key to be his disciple. Okay. Continuing on. Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. And this brings us back to John 14, okay? talking about prayer. Okay? And we looked at the verse in 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15, where John says that the confidence that he has in the Lord is that when he asks of things that are in accordance with the word of God, he knows that they will happen. And that's based on right here. Because if you're in the word of God, seeing what his will is, you're abiding in the true vine. You're abiding in Jesus Christ because his words are in your heart and in your spirit, and they affect what you do in your body. Does the word of God abide in you? Does it dwell in you richly? Okay. Is that your goal? Is that what you're trying to, to live for? Okay. How dare you lift up a book? Well, God did. He glorified his book. It's actually commanded to me. Did you know that? 2 Thessalonians 3. That the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified. Okay. I didn't sin. I'm not the one giving fruit of lies here, making assumptions. Read your Bible. Okay. Verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified. Now the Lord's starting to conclude this whole illustration now. Herein is my Father glorified. How? That ye bear much fruit because you abide in the true vine. So shall ye be my disciples, connecting everything together. Because he was the first one to present this. None of the other apostles made it up. They just got some more information that the Lord gave them. Okay. This is where the, this is very close to the idea he presented in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount in verse 16, where he tells you to let your light so shine before men okay, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Well, you need to abide in the true vine so that as you bear fruit, for the father, he as the husband can work and that you get brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter so you can bear much fruit. That's the goal here. Okay. Now the astute Christian might ask, what's the fruit? Because you haven't even told me that. That's a good question. What is that fruit? What is it that a Christian today should be manifesting to the world? Uh, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, is love, joy, Peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law, the Bible says. And the idea is, as you abide in the true vine of Jesus Christ, now the Holy Ghost is shed abroad in your heart by faith. He lives there. See? That seal, the Lord knows you're one of His. His spirit bore witness to your spirit that you are a child of God. And now you have to make the decision to depart from iniquity. And in that moment, you bear or you manifest, you show the fruit of the spirit of God. Okay. This is the type of fruit that the Lord already gave us three of them. Okay. In John 14, he says love. He's talking about if you love me, keep my commandments. Then he tells you that peace, that peace with God and the peace of God that he promises at the end of John 14. And here, we just read it at the end of verse 11, he wants to make sure your joy is full. Notice that if you abide in the true vine, those first three characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit, which are tied to your direct relationship with God Almighty, those are barren. That's what you bear out. Okay? It has an effect on your life. Okay? 
Then all of a sudden, as you bear that fruit, the Lord, the Father, is going to prune you and help you bear the rest of those characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit that affect yourself as you walk with God and others. It's kind of like the crucified life. Okay? That upward beam of love, the love of God should have brought in your hearts. The joy of the Holy Ghost okay? and righteousness. Okay? That's the kingdom of God, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The peace with God and the peace of God, because now he's not your enemy, and he wants to help you through every trial. Then all of a sudden, you can long suffer other people as they ridicule you and call you names. Okay? You can be gentle and good to them, willing to give, willing to work with them, no matter where they are. Okay? And your faith grows and grows as the word of God is put more and more in your heart. And your faith grows. And it allows you to understand that you need to give things to God. Especially when you, you might be angry at somebody because they yelled at you. Give it to God. That's meekness. And God brings balance to your life so you're temperate in all things. In your service to him and your service to the world. If he has other responsibilities like your family and stuff, he'll make sure you're balanced out. That's the fruit of the spirit of God. See that? And that's the kind of light that people will see and say, no, he's different. That's a fanatic right there. That's one of them. He's, he's not this Christian out there. He's different. Talk to him. You'll find out all he ever talks about is the word of God. Okay. Well, all I ever want to talk about is Jesus. That, sh that should be the goal of every Christian. Ye shall be my disciples, what the Lord said. And by that, the Father is glorified as you focus on manifesting, basically, the true vine. Manifesting Jesus Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay. Is that where you're at? Okay. And I like that. You start with that little piece. You got saved. You got the love of God in your heart. Okay. You got some joy. You got some peace. You started right there. You bared some fruit. All of a sudden, the Father sees that. And he's like, okay, it's time to start pruning you so you can bring forth more and manifest more of those fruits as you grow in grace and knowledge of the Savior. And that affects other people who are born again. Okay, bringing in the sheaves. There it is. Okay. John 15, verse 9. Okay. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. There's the love right there. And this right here, brethren, is sanctification simplified. That's all there is to it. Keep the commandments. First question I have for any Christian, do you have the word of God? 90% of them don't even know it's this book right here. Every single word. I got every single word right here in English. No doubts. Zero. See? None. Is that you? How could you love God and keep his commandments? You don't even know where they are. This is what the devil has managed to do over 2,000 years. Confuse Christians in this way. Okay. And sure, I'll admit that at least on this side, this hemisphere of the world, there's not that much physical persecution going on with Christians, but the majority of them are just spiritually dead in the water. Okay. We're all a bunch of dead branches that are just getting pruned and taken away. We're not useful because we don't even know where the Bible is. How could we love God? We can't even keep his commandments. Yeah. Makes you feel like Daniel a little bit. Tearing up in prayer for the nation, if you will. Christianity. Because yeah. it's sad. It's not good when you have so few my age that are willing to live for God. Okay. It's a testament of how much judgment has been brought here to the house of God because we failed. And Abiding in the love of Jesus Christ. Continuing on, Jude 21 says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Now you know what that means. It means keep the commandments. That's all it ever meant. It's not that I have to, keep, I have to maintain my salvation. It has nothing to do with that. Okay? Jude's trying to tell you you need to stay in that common faith that was once delivered to the saints. Jude uh, 3, I believe it is. Okay, same epistle. Okay. And so your job, Christian, is to make the decision to die daily. And usually that decision starts with you waking up, praying to God, and open up your Bible. How many people read their Bible every day? Yeah. Pretty sure people who are living for God do. Okay, everybody here does. 
<laughs> but unfortunately, that's the, that's the issue. Okay. I had my wife the other day talking about an illustration she heard from my sister. And she was dealing with another younger Christian who was saying, I don't like reading my Bible every day. And she was like, well, do you like cooking for your family? She's like, I don't really like it, but why do you do it? Okay, so we got to eat. Okay, well, guess what? You may not like reading your Bible. You got you to read it. You got to eat. Okay. You really love God, you'll do something even if you don't like it. And maybe as you grow in grace and knowledge, you'll develop a love and a taste for it. Yeah. And maybe that asparagus you didn't like all of a sudden becomes something you love. That happened to me. Yeah. I was not a fan of asparagus when I was younger. I love it now. Praise the Lord. Okay, A lot of bitter, a lot of bitter stuff here, but there's a lot of stuff that tastes like honey as well. Revelation 10, I believe. Got a little bit of everything in the Bible. Full balanced meal. Praise the Lord. Because he loves you. Okay. And then we'll end with verse 11 here. So we're almost done. Verse 11, which we saw was connected to joy. Okay. Now what's joy? It's definitely when you rejoice in the Lord for the blessings He's bestowed on you and continues to give you. It's definitely that happiness you feel in those moments when you're rejoicing to God and giving Him praise. When you sing to Him, like we sing the hymns and all this. There's definitely joy in that. But that joy unspeakable, which is full of glory, can even allow you to endure trials and temptation and go through the difficult moments of life. Just like with Jesus Christ, who, with the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, to be your author and finisher of your faith, as he went to the cross. So the fullness of joy that he wants to give to you right here is the same joy that got him to the cross of Calvary to save you from your sins. Now you talk about a trial. I don't think any of us have gone anywhere close to that kind of suffering. So you know that the Lord's joy can handle any situation. Now I'd like to show you something very interesting. Go to Psalm 16. Go to Psalm 16, and older brethren hear me, verse 11. Check this out. Psalm 16, 11. Bible says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. Talking about the God of the universe. For in his presence you have fullness of joy. As he's shown you the path of life, Jesus Christ is the life. At thy right hand, the right hand of the Father is Jesus Christ. There are pleasures forevermore. But notice, it's in Psalm 16, verse 11. Do you have the 1611? It's the path of life. Fullness of joy in His presence is found here. Because this is the book the Holy Ghost is testifying to. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Being more general, 1 John 1, okay, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. That's a little spiritual thing there. But 1 John 1, there's, there's a lot of instances like that in the in the Bible, by the way. A lot of 1611s that are very interesting. First yeah. John 1 and verse 3, John says, yeah. I'm in the wrong epistle here. Yeah. First John 1 and verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, talking about that word of life that was manifested and was with the Father, Jesus Christ, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, because Jesus is the true vine. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. I notice that. Okay. So the key to fellowship with Jesus Christ, the key to being in in that presence of God full of joy is actually walking and abiding in the way, the truth, and the life as you come closer and closer to the Father in your walk down here. And that's why the Lord ended his little illustration with verse 11 saying that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for showing us that you are the true vine. And I just ask that you help us recognize our role as the branches, trying to get as much water as possible to bear as much fruit, as many good grapes as we possibly can, Lord. 
and help us to see the parts of us that need to be chopped off because they're dead, Lord, so we can submit them to you, Father. That way you as a husband can make us more and more holy.